All right. Hi, everybody. Um, we're at the top of the hour, so just want to welcome everybody. Um, we're asking that you all introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, right where you're from, and also what program you're from. Uh, so we wanted to just take some time to let everyone in, but also uh, welcome to our after school in Native American and Tribal Communities webinar. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time out of your day to learn more about our initiative and hear our stories. Uh, so as part of the Secretary of Education's Raise the Bar, Lead the World initiative, the department is uh, prioritizing achieving academic excellence, boldly improving learning conditions, and creating pathways for global engagement. A key piece of this work is looking at parent and family engagement. Uh, so the department created the Engage Every Student initiative to provide high quality out of school time learning opportunities for every child who wants to participate. Uh, so the department is really thrilled to be in partnership among five organizations in this effort. And that's the School of Superten Superintendents Association, the After School Alliance, the National League of Cities, the National Summer Learning Association, and the National Comprehensive Center at Westat. So collectively, we're demonstrating what we know is key to addressing the unmet need at our state, local, and tribal levels. And that's intentional collaboration and partnership. Next slide. So we also wanted to welcome everybody. Um, we're on day nine of Native American Heritage Month. Um, and the Department of Education and After School Alliance uh, would also like to acknowledge that uh, Washington, D.C., uh, where I'm currently located at, uh, is the ancestral homelands of the Nacotian or Anacostian and Piscataway Conaway people. Um, we acknowledge the history of this country, that it also includes genocide and forced removal of indigenous people from this territory. Um, so we also want to pay respects for uh, those ancestors, uh, their elders, past and present. And we just wanted to take a moment to consider the many legacies that we have um, of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement uh, that bring us here today. Um, and just wanted to acknowledge all of the people who were on this land. Uh, but we also acknowledge that this land acknowledgement is not enough, and it becomes more meaningful when we have uh, coupled work with authentic relationships and informed actions. Um, so we are all striving to do that work together. Uh, we also invite all of you to uh, write in the chat uh, which lands you are from, um, and we'll uh, put a link in the chat too, so you'll be able to see um, which uh, traditional homelands you're currently on. So feel free to share that in the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing where you all are uh, located at, um, and thank you for, for taking some time to, to help acknowledge that. Uh, so uh, I realize I've been talking and haven't introduced myself. <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Naomi Miguel. Uh, I spoke to you initially in uh, Autumn. Um, I'm Thana Autumn from Southern Arizona. Um, I'm also the executive director of the White House Initiative on Advancing Education, Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunities for Native Americans and Tribal Colleges and Universities. Uh, it's a very long title. Uh, we joke around uh, with the secretary that I may have the longest title in the federal government. Uh, we have yet to see if that's true, uh, but I invite you all to be on the lookout for longer titles. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to spend just a few minutes telling you about our White House initiative. Uh, and, um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so our White House initiative is, um, as I mentioned, housed in the Department of Education. Uh, we also have three co-chairs, uh, Secretary Miguel Cardona, 
who is the Secretary of Education, uh, Secretary Deb Holland, uh, who is the Secretary of Interior, and Secretary, uh, Acting Secretary Julie Hsu, uh, who is the Secretary of Labor. Um, so we have each of those uh, secretaries involved in our initiative, um, looking at education across BIE and public education, but also looking at workforce uh, with their labor connection as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so our executive order is very long and we have a very big uh, charge and work ahead of us, but we have about 10 different objectives that we work on uh, for the White House initiative. Uh, one of them is looking at education equity. So looking at any systemic barriers or um, inequities in education, ranging from early education to uh, secondary and post-secondary. Um, also looking at data sovereignty. So how can we help support the data that'll help uh, our students and also um, help via uh, help gauge federal funding as well. So also supporting higher education and high quality education, um, doing agency work. So working among our uh, federal agencies to make sure we're finding equity in education. Uh, promoting outreach, so working with nonprofit agencies, uh, private, uh, public private partnerships, and also promoting student well being. I think that that's where today's conversation is really going to be a, a highlight. Uh, so, looking at uh, the pandemic and how it impacted our tribal communities, but looking at how we can help support students um, on the federal level so that we can maintain those academic levels or bring up those academic levels uh, to where they were pre-pandemic, but that we're providing the resources they need uh, from, from coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so also supporting tribal consultation, so ways that the um, Department of Education can interact with tribes, uh, supporting career building, and that includes adult education, career and technical education, and then also incorporating Native American traditions in education. So uh, where there are programs that are incorporating tradition, culture, Native language, we want to make sure we're um, highlighting that and promoting that. And the last piece is excellence. So where um, there are students, teachers, administrators, uh, programs that are doing things right and that is helping the community and our students uh, that we're highlighting that work um, down on the ground. Uh, that's uh, it for me. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm going to kick it all over to our After School Alliance. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naomi. My name is Sophie Kidd and I work on the field outreach and research teams at the After School Alliance. Um, the Alliance is so honored to be hosting this webinar with the Department of Education and the Engage Every Student Initiative. We're so excited today to be taking a deep dive into after school in Native American and tribal communities. Thank you to our incredible panelists and to Don Marie for what I'm sure will be an insightful conversation. The Alliance began to focus on after school for Native American youth and their families in the fourth edition of our America After 3 p.m. survey, which some of you may have heard of and we'll be chatting more about shortly. For the first time, we had enough data from Native American parents to create a brief providing nationwide insight into the after school experiences of Native American children and youth. And that will be dropped in the chat shortly as well if you'd like to take a further look. We're looking forward to finding more ways to spotlight and amplify the work of after school and summer learning programs serving Native students. We hope this webinar today serves as a catalyst to spark more conversations, make connections, and foster relationships. And so next, I'm passing it over to the amazing Dawn Marie Johnson. Dawn Marie's full bio will be in the chat, but I just have to take a second and brag on her. Um, Dawn Marie is of Sisseton Wapiton Oyate descent, and she's from Wabe, South Dakota. She now resides in Sioux Falls. Um, and in a historic achievement in 2023, Dawn Marie was elected as a Sioux Falls School District Board member, making her the first woman of color to hold this esteemed position. So round of applause. Got to give her her flowers for that, for sure. Um, and she was formerly employed as the Director of Leadership and Culture for the South Dakota After School Network. And for the previous two years, she devoted her time as the Career Technical Education and Community Outreach Coordinator for the Sioux Falls School District. 
Take it away, John Marie. Thank you so much, Sophie, for that warm welcome. I'm so happy to see the U.S. Department of Education and Engage Every Student Partners elevating the importance of after-school programs for Native American youth and families. A little bit why this matters to me. So a couple of pictures displayed up here is one from my election night with my daughter, Rain. She has been my why for most everything, but as a mother, having her to have access to quality after school care is incredibly important for me to do all the great things that I'm able to do. In the middle, you'll see two young ladies that I've been fortunate to mentor for quite some time. One of them since she was in third grade and she's about to graduate. I feel so old. But to be able to have this opportunity with these two ladies, we were be able to be the first and only student panel on a mental health youth conference, and they were able to shed light to what it meant to them to be able to have access to after school care and have access to mentors and have access just overall to more supports to get them through what's happening as a youth in today's society. So I'm so proud of those two gals. And um, from that work, I've been able to just highlight and give a youth voice, because as we know, every decision that we make, even from an after school, and for me, a school board member, it, the, the true driver is the youth. We need to be listening to the youth. We need to lean into what they're saying. So some of the work that I'm really proud of is being able to feature youth like Madeline and Lily that you see in the picture in the middle. More recently, I was able to do a really cool, I call it a world tour with our STEM trailers through the South Dakota After School Network. And we took these trailers that were filled with really fun, engaging activities to powwows. And we were able to interact with kids during those, during those times. And just to see the light in their eyes glowing and how excited they were to have a woman who looks like their auntie show up and be like, let's do some engineering. I have full confidence that I met the next NASA engineer on this little world tour that we had going across all the reservations that summer. And it's something that I definitely wanted to highlight because it's through programs like this, it's through initiatives like this, after school programming, that kids get an extra opportunity to see something that they might not get to experience during school. So a lot of my work has been inside school settings. I have 10 plus years working inside of a school in rural, urban, and reservation. So I'm coming with a wealth of knowledge, but you guys, this this panel is, I'm so excited because I've gotten to learn about the three people and you guys are in for a real treat to, to experience what life has been like across the country and um, the importance of after school. So enough about me. Again, I'm so excited to moderate this panel discussion today. But before we go into that, I just want to offer up some context on what we know about the after school experiences of Native American families. Um, the data I will share, as Sophie highlighted, is from the After School Alliance America's After 3 p.m. study that I know she and her team worked so hard on. So please make sure you um, take a screenshot of this little QR code, look at it. I know they dropped it into, into the chat box, but take a good look at it. There's a lot of comprehensive stuff in there, but here's a little more context to it. Um, after school programs play an important role in Native American communities providing support for children that include academic support, enrichment activities, uh, building relationships with peers, adults, health and wellness programming, um, and just letting students, especially Native families, get to be within their culture. Um, here's a little bit more brief overview of some points, but again, please be sure to take a look at that. So among Native American children, and these two little gals off to the side, they were <laughs> a part of my world tour. They were frequent flyers of uh, the Sistin powwow that I was able to go to this last summer. And I had so much fun with them building. So I had to drop that picture in there. But among Native children who were not enrolled in after school programs, 45% would have been enrolled if they were available. Again, I grew up in a really small area in, in Wabe, and we didn't have an after-school program. 
So this means a lot to me to know that there are things that exist now that offer kids like the two sweet gals you see in there, those opportunities. And so this is so true outside of the school year. Um, 41% of Native American children would have been enrolled in a summer program if it were available. Native American parents were surveyed and they shared that they're looking for an after-school program to be an, in a convenient location that provide a safe environment for their students. And they know that they are in the care of staff in a safe environment. And I'm really excited because we're gonna hear from two incredible providers today. In after-school programs, Native American youth are more likely than other racial or ethnic groups to receive homework and academic help, take part in a physical activity, engage in STEM and learning opportunities, and they have the opportunity to build life skills and receive a healthy snack or meal. More than four in 10 Native American parents reported that their children's after-school program does not include cultural programming, However, programming aligned with family values is something that Native American parents and families shared was essential. 69% of respondents said it was either extremely or somewhat important for a child's after-school program to share their same family values. I definitely fall in that category. Native American parents with a child in a program agree that after school helps them keep their jobs. Again, I can't say this enough. For me personally, having my daughter reign in our local boys, boys and girls club is vital for me to be able to do all the things that I do. Native American parents overall agree that after school programs provide working parents a peace of mind knowing that their children are safe and supervised. So barriers to participation have grown. Um, access, convenience, cost, those are great barriers to after-school participation. And the percentage of Native American families facing these barriers is increasing. So growing up in a rural reservation town, there was not a local YMCA alone, fresh groceries within a 45 minute drive. So I can definitely speak to the importance of having this access and what it means to children in today's society. Uh, next, there we go. Native American families highly value after school and summer experiences for their children and have a high level of support for public funding for after school and summer learning opportunities. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sophie. That was just a brief overview. Again, be sure to check out that comprehensive look at America after 3 p.m. Awesome. Thank you so much, Don Marie. That was great. So now we're going to take a second to get to know one another before we are pop into an amazing discussion. So what we would love for you to do, we're going to use a platform called Mentimeter. So log on to menti.com or and use that code that you'll see right here or click on the link in the chat box. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show those results. We talked about being up in the Oh, yes, the menti code. Yes, it should be right above in the chat. And I think when I share the screen, it will show. Yes, 2741311. Awesome. We've got a bunch of program providers joining us today, tribal education agencies after school intermediary, folks working at schools, also other. Awesome, I love seeing the color. I need some fun music in between the Jeopardy theme or something, <laughs> but awesome. Okay, fabulous. Feels fabulous. Oh, thank you for the thumbs up, love it. Awesome, okay, so a lot of program providers, after school intermediaries, amazing. Okay, okay. And now I'm going to switch to the next question. I think. Perfect. What are you most interested in learning about today? And so you can just type it in the short answer section, the importance of after school programming, everything you all have to offer, open to all the lessons and insights. 
action items I can use to host more inclusive and accessible programming for Native students. How to serve after school programs with financial and modern learning mechanic skills. Outreach and engaging with the Native families, partnering with organizations. Awesome. Best support our local Native American community. Successful partnerships. Awesome. Oh, these all look great. Oh my gosh, expanding after school access. Oh my gosh, so many wonderful responses. How to go beyond land acknowledgement. Accessible. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all for your participation. I will kick it back over to Don Marie and start screen sharing again. Awesome. Thank you, Sophie. So again, we are here to hear from the experts in the field. And I'm going to start with Shanice Kai Aikala. She currently serves as the Senior Legislative Analyst at the National Indian Education Association, NIEA. Her responsibilities encompass a range of educational topics, including K-12, early childhood education, school climate, workforce development. Um, previously, Shanice worked as a legislative fellow for NIEA, where she conducted after-school research and analyzed policies affecting Native communities during coronavirus pandemic. Thomas Azarella is the director of Alaska After School Network. He has over 20 years of managerial experience in after school and summer programs. He has extensive experience in working with community collaborations to increase youth protective factors throughout Alaska. Tayana James Boleyn is the 21st Century Community Learning Center Program Coordinator for the Navajo preparatory schools in Farmington, New Mexico. Tiana is passionate about perpetuating indigenous languages and cultures by offering top-notch out-of-school time programming to our students. I want to give you guys, you three, the time and space to share a little bit about yourselves. And if any extra introductions you'd like to do, I'd invite you to do that now. So tell me about yourself, the role you play in after school, and really what motivates you to do this work. Why don't we start, start with Shanice? Of course. Um, aloha mai kako o Shanice kaikala ko inoa. Ma kahului mayao, ma wahine kona desi ike manava. Um, so my name is Shanice. Um, as Don Marie mentioned, um, I'm Native Hawaiian, um, and I serve as a senior legislative analyst for NIA um, based in D.C. Um, I'm very grateful. I feel like this conversation is um, kind of close to home because I am very grateful that I'm back to be in Hawaii, um, you know, with my sister and uh, my new nephew, um, and I think that is kind of the main motivator that drives me, um, as well as my personal experience growing up in Hawaii. Um, it's very unique com um, compared to the lower 48. Um, um, and yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I jumped in um, bringing my own experience as a child kind of seeing, you know, some of the um, opportunities that were afforded to me and really taking a look at what my experience in after school time was personally, as well as summertime, um, especially as a, um, a Native youth. And um, jumping into after school time has been very fulfilling. Um, I primarily have been researching different policies as well well as conducting surveys uh, with my colleague on what after school time looks like and realizing there are so many different gaps that kind of overlap with existing education issues. Um, and being at NIA, trying to figure out how we can be more supportive. You know, I think that after school time is a bigger word for the work that um, our Native communities are already doing. Um, you know, after school time touches culture, it, it touches language, um, being engaged with your community. Um, so I will leave it at that um, and uh, look forward to the rest of this conversation. Yeah, I have to send huge shout out to NIEA 
and Shanice's team, they were, uh, they hosted a nice get together for after school professionals just to be in that sort of space and to be welcomed in that sort of way. You know, oftentimes as after school professionals, we're not seen as educators and to be welcomed and to be able to collaborate and really build bridges and connect with NIEA was so special. And we're really glad that we were able to start this great work and continue on. So I'm so glad to have you here and to get your perspective on things. Um, next, I'm gonna turn it over to Thomas, who is apparently just pummeled with snow. Can I say that? Is that a bad word? Go ahead, Thomas. It's a real thing. We have our first snow day here in, uh, in Alaska um, today. Uh, my name is Thomas Azarella uh, and so, uh, I am the dr executive director of the Alaska After School Network. So we are a statewide coalition of over 360 out of school time partners from around uh, the state of Alaska. And we are a program of the Alaska Children's Trust. So I want to start off by uh, just saying, first off, uh, I am here in Anchorage on Denina land uh, and that we work across the entirety of uh, the Alaska Native Peoples regions, including all uh, 200 and I think it's 231 federally recognized tribes uh, here in Alaska um, that we are working and supporting uh, with. One of the key things I wanted uh, to share in my introduction as well is I recognize uh, I am a white male. Um, I am originally from Buffalo, New York. I'm not originally from Alaska and Alaska is my home. Uh, and I really deeply believe uh, in the work that our organization, both the Alaska Children's Trust, our parent organization, the Alaska After School Network is doing really to take a step back and reflect to see what are ways that we as an organization, uh, especially a white Western organization um, inside of the education sphere uh, is both either perpetrating uh, uh, harm and challenges and pushing uh, Western ideology, uh, ideals and practices um, uh, into our communities, but also ways that we need to undo uh, that historical trauma that has come from the education system uh, and really think strategically and listen strategically to our uh, tribal partners and our tribal youth around uh, how we can do better and well, we need to do better uh, as a collective. And I think that's a lot of what today I'll be sharing is ways that we as an organization are uh, listening, thinking, and doing differently um, to really support and meet the needs of our tribal communities, especially our tribal uh, youth here in Alaska. Um, and that includes really broadly, we have a large Hawaiian population and Samoan population and Pacific Islander population in Alaska as well. So we recognize that uh, when we are doing this work, when we are uplifting uh, indigenous youth and supporting native communities, that this is the right work as our organization really pushes forward to, to ensure that we have greater uh, representation and access of after school for all young people. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, one toolkit that Thomas and his team has on their website, I hope you're able to share it and I hope you don't mind I'm talking about it. But more recently, our Orange Shirt Day, they have a comprehensive toolkit showcasing Orange Shirt Day, which I valued so much and I used and I shared out to my whole school district and they found a lot of value in that. So thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, Tayana, would you please introduce yourself? And I think you have some slides to share because you have some unique, incredible programming going on with your preparatory school. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. She'e Tiana James Blin Yanisha, Bilagana Yanye di Klinkit Nishle, Kline di Klinkit Bashishchin, Bilagana Dashache, Denenahatloni Dekina Haida Dashanella. Craig Do Cloak Alaska Dantnasha, Sarak Andik Ahasht Eh, Pialap de Shiaho Ak Otego Asananishle. I just wanted to do my my Denev introduction first um, because that's where I am currently based. Um, I also want to share my Shlinga introduction with you all. Anyat Usani Ashk Edwoods Yuchatu Asauk. Ah, Blake Ak Ena Tiana James Blin Yuchatu Yuchatu Asak Link Ayahat Ut Nahat Nah Hatsati Yane Di Ayahat Clinket Tan Dach Ayahat Takuk on Dach Ayahat Sine Di Yadi Ayahat Washdan Kwan Dutch Han Ayahat 
ach da kann ich hören ja genau na kati kina küsse die ah genet chisch genet chisch um so my I'm gonna go ahead and share this too. Um, my my paternal my maternal grandparents are Patsy Ethers Neal and the late Patrick Neal. My um, paternal grandparents are the late Rachel Demert and the late Gordon Ralph James Sr. My parents are Marianne and Gordon Ralph James Jr. And I was named after my great 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 aunt um, Romaine Demert. And so um, again, I'm I'm Flinga and not the Baskin. Um, from Southeast and South Central Alaska. I grew up on the Pialp Reservation in Washington, um, and I currently reside um, in Denecta in uh, Farmington, New Mexico area. Um, <laughs> and so I just wanna say thank you again. I'm, I'm truly grateful to be here. And um, again, I work at Navajo Preparatory School in Farmington, New Mexico. Um, which is a certified international baccalaureate world school, um, which means um, that our students are eligible to acquire a globally recognized diploma. Um, and we're one of the few IB schools, um, indigenous IB schools around the world that serve, serve primarily all indigenous students. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little nervous because I'm super, <laughs> I'm very, very, very happy that this is happening. Um, and currently our school is actually working to get Diné language um, recognized as one of the um, languages that counts under the IB. Um, they're working closely with IB there in Washington, D.C. to make that happen. And that'll also lead the way for other indigenous languages um, to be recognized under the IB as well. So um, we are a college preparatory high school. So we serve ninth through 12th grade. Um, we're a tribally controlled school with the BIE, serving about 284 students from 60 plus communities um, from the four corners, but also, also nationally. 98% um, of our students are indigenous, primarily Diné. Um, and two thirds of those students are residential students. So they live here on campus five days a week, Mon uh, Sunday through Friday afternoon, and then they go home on the weekends. Um, and every weekend, our buses tra um, travel 1200 miles to pick up our students and bring them in each week. Um, we have a, re a weekend residential program now where students can stay 24 seven, except for on those holiday breaks. So now we can accept students, more students interna um, nationally. And so all across the nation. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so for Navajo Preparatory School, we have a 21st century community learning centers program. And uh, for our program, we are under, um, we're BIE state funded. Um, I'm so grateful to have our BIE coordinator who's on the line. Um, she's extremely supportive um, to our program. And um, our activities are a little different since our students do live here on campus, majority of them. Um, we do have some local students, but our activities run about 3.30 to 9 p.m. Sunday through Thursday. Um, and we also have, of course, those weekend programs for the students that do stay on the weekends and lunch hour activities. And another way that we're unique from a lot of other programming, because we serve high school students, um, all of our programming, um, probably 98% of our programming is drop-in. So whenever they can come, whenever they have time in between their studies or their other programming, their athletics, they drop in when they can and go when they need to. And so um, <clears throat> for our specific program, our primary goals, of course, are academic enrichment um, to per perpetuate, to help in per the perpetuation of Diné language and culture. I personally try not to use preserve because to me that means it's sitting in a museum and isn't being used. So we wanna keep that going, keep it living. And so um, alongside college and career readiness, programming, uh, life skills and real world skills so that our students, one of the, uh, some of the feedback we got from our alumni was that, um, Navo Preparatory School uh, truly prepared them for college and the academic rigor. 
Um, the one area that we could use more support is teaching them how to cook healthy food and work on their vehicles and um, be able to repair things in their homes on their own um, so that they can afford um, uh, college life or, you know, um, have those abilities in their careers. Uh, and last but not least, of course, um, a huge focus on social emotional wellness. <clears throat> so I kind of went along with the theme of the presentation, starting off with perspectives. Um, we do the surveys to all of our stakeholders three times a year at the beginning of the school year, uh, winter break, and at the end of the school year. And we take all of this feedback extremely um, seriously. And so we try to implement everything that we can um, to help us identify the areas of need, you know, areas that we can improve on, guide the program initiatives using our grant goals. That's always our focus. Um, and then <clears throat> the biggest thing though, is we really try to prioritize and encourage and strengthen that student voice. Um, we, we try to make sure that students know, hey, you can come to us anytime with a suggestion and we will do everything we can to input that right away. Um, for the, um, sorry, one of the things that I feel like we do that's pretty unique is we recognize that we have a wealth of knowledge right here within our community. And so we try to invite all stakeholders, students, staff, families, alumni, to come in and share community members their area of expertise. And so um, we get some amazing uh, presenters um, through those invitations. Uh, and then all of this together, and I, I wanted to make sure, you know, of course, these are our stakeholders here on the left-hand side, the family, academic staff, non-academic staff, residential program, and our community and our alumni. And all of these entities have a huge impact on our program. Um, there's so many of our non-academic staff that contribute highly to our after-school programming. Our IT program provides um, uh, all things like technology activity after school. That's amazing. So we can go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. So for each of the areas of our focus, this kind of gives you an idea of the types of programming that we have. Um, I'm not going to list all of them, because I could spend a lot of time on this, but if you have any questions, feel free to read through. Um, a couple of the favorites I would love to share is, um, we have culture night every week um, at our school, um, and a lot of other additional cultural programming uh, mixed throughout. But right now, every year, or right now, every Tuesday is our culture night. And each culture night, we uh, make sure to integrate cultural foods and um, teach them how to make one of a, a small traditional food item and occasionally we'll do more of a stew. Um, and then another program we started this year is called Hush Jishna. And um, it means we're preparing ourselves. So the goal is that our students, if they were to attend this program throughout the year, um, they would have full traditional dress from toe to head. Um, and so, and they'd learn how to make all of that themselves. And so hopefully by the time they graduate, they have four sets to take with them off to college to, um, <clears throat> to keep with them, to keep, to bring home with them, but also um, in Dene philosophy, um, your, the traditional dress, of course, all has a purpose and there's different things that are um, part of it that um, serve as protection for you and help um, help you in your life. So, um, those are a few, I'm trying to go down the list really quick. Um, <clears throat> another one that I was asked to emphasize on is we have, um, a natural helpers peer to peer support group here at Navajo Preparatory School. That is, a, a state, um, program, um, that we've, we've taken on here at Navajo Prep. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer support program where our students, those that are selected by their peers or by staff as natural helpers, that they naturally want to help those around them, they are, um, um, they're trained in what is 
essentially QPR, which is question um, persuade ripper. And, um, but for a youth version and so that they can know the signs and be able to recognize the signs of a student that who may, who may be having thoughts of suicide. And so they know how to ask the question, how to uh, recognize those signs, when to refer to an adult is the biggest thing, when to ask for help. And so, um, cause there's a lot of studies that show that students will turn to their peers um, before they turn to an adult. So um, these students have been crucial in, in bringing um, peers to uh, the support staff here, um, our counselors, um, when they do need that extra help. So I think that'll be it for now. If you have questions on anything else, I'd love to share more. Yeah, what I've grown to really appreciate about you, even knowing you in this short amount of time, is your passion always comes through. And when you start talking about the programs that you guys offer, I mean, everything that you've done and just shared is so incredible. And those kids are so incredibly lucky to have you as your, as the director of that. But what I want to hear out of all the things you just mentioned, which are all so incredible, what are you most proud of? And maybe there was something that you didn't even hit on yet, but what are you most proud of, of all the programs and the connectivity you have and the leaders you're seeing step up? Like what's, what's the bright, shiny thing that you could give us right now? <clears throat> I think I definitely, I'm extremely proud of our, our cultural programming, but mostly because of what it's bringing out of our students. And so, um, we have a really solid group of students and it just continues to grow um, and evolve and change constantly. Um, but I feel like we are definitely um, preparing our future leaders. And one of our, our motto for our school is Yudis Kago Nat Ani, which is loosely translated to leaders now and into the future. And so constantly remembering that we're, we're preparing our students to be those leaders for our communities. And so um, when I first started here at PrEP, and I said I wasn't gonna mention him, but my other L half also um, works here at Navajo Preparatory School and he's our Denebazad Dine Institute coordinator. We started at the same time. And when we first came here, um, you know, a few people, a few students would wear their traditional dress here and there or for our traditional dress days, which is on Wednesdays. Um, but now it's any day of the week, you'll see 10 plus kids just, you know, wearing the traditional dress um, and they're proud of it. They're not, they're not bashful about it. And um, it's just really beautiful to see. Um, and uh, we have students here that are such big um, helpers. They have huge hearts. Um, and, and it really is, we always, we're constantly reminding our students of eh, which is that um, your relationships, uh, your clan relationships is a big thing here with Navo Prep. We start every year with their, eh, their, their, their uh, familial relationships with those around them. And, um, you know, we do have a small, are a big family here at PrEP. And it's just, I love seeing how much our students have grown. And so. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I, I know everybody, I'm seeing everybody say like, I want to connect with you. I don't, I want to learn more. Like, again, your passion just shines when you talk about it. Um, so I hope I get to visit one day. This sounds like such an incredible place to be. Thank you again for sharing. Um, Thomas, I would love to hear what your proudest accomplishments are. Yeah, well, I mean, that is really hard to follow up on. <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> amazing. I'm like, wow, uh, uh, how can how can I uh, be a fly on the wall in that program and see that magic happening? Um, so I, I should share um, the Alaska After School Network, we are one in 50 after school networks. So every state has an after school network and we work as intermediaries. We work in really three key, way, three key ways to support, strengthen and advocate for quality out of school time program. 
that role around support is really being that centralized convener and catalyst inside of the field. So for us, what that looks like inside of supporting our native and tribal communities is around how do we uh, help connect programs, uh, you know, both tribal and non-tribal -program, uh, non programs together to be uh, able to share and learn from each other. We spend too much time, the out-of-school time space, reinventing things where we know they're great practices. So a part of our role as a network is to help lift up those amazing practices that are happening, especially in many of our tribal communities and rural communities, and share those with others and connect. That other role that I mentioned is around strengthening. So that piece around really, how do we increase the professional development uh, uh, for after school educators? And how do we ensure that education and those trainings and those workshops are culturally responsive to the unique cultures of our students, especially our Alaska Native uh, and Pacific Islander uh, students as well. And part of that is also us examining you know, what is the lens? How are we delivering training? How are we making it accessible? Are we uh, ensuring that we're connecting and lifting those best practices that are being uh, in state? Uh, how are we sharing those outward? And I think that's one of the things that we've really focused on. But that last role that uh, we play is as an advocate and we advocate at the federal, state and local level. And one of the pieces that we uh, advocated on um, was the creation of what is called the Marijuana Education Treatment Fund. So Alaska is a state where there is an adult marketplace for marijuana that's legalized. Uh, and with that, there was sales tax that was being collected by the state. And so we as a, a collective network, along with our key partners uh, in the legislature, as well as the Department of Health and Social Services, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, pushed forward to really securing some of that marijuana sales tax revenue at the state level for an after school fund that created our first ever funding stream for after school in Alaska. Well, that fund uh, had its first RFP in 2019, uh, and what we saw right away from the fund is that while, yes, the fund was impacting uh, tribal students uh, and Native students from around the state, but what we saw was that there was a lack of uh, applications coming from our tribal communities um, and tribal entities. And so with, uh, uh, with the Department of Health um, in this last round of our RF, uh, RFP, so the state administers this grant program, it's $1.8 million that goes out for after school. There was now a tribal set aside that was specifically uh, to helping fund uh, tribal, uh, tribal programs and really open, opening up that ability and creating space inside of what is a very white and Western way of us funding programs of here's this grant you have to apply for, and here's all these portals and things like that, was that we were even as a first attempt to create space for this is a funding uh, opportunity specific for tribes and do outreach on it. I'll say, we have a lot of work to do still on that area. We know that we have to, in the next round of the RFP, we still didn't see the uh, turnout we'd like to, despite the high demand for funding inside of our tribal and rural communities. Um, we know that we didn't see as many applicants as we like. And now we're in that process right now of looking through with the state of what are ways that we can actually change grant language? How can we do a better job of helping support, especially uh, many of our smaller tribal communities that may not have the full capacity of some of our large tribal corporations to be able to have a grant writer, but how can we help do more mentorship and support um, over the next several years to help ensure that those uh, programs or entities and communities that weren't funded have an opportunity to be inside of that funding stream. So while I'd say that's the thing I'm most excited about, that we have a funding stream that is acknowledging and supporting a tribal after school program. And really, after school for us, we have a broad definition. That means culture camps. It means a fish camp. It means engaging kids in uh, learning language and dance and really helping the next round of this work is really in the next uh, in the next RFP will be out, unfortunately, in three or so years. Uh, but really looking at how do we re-envision how we can change the language to ensure that it's more relevant to our tribal communities to make sure that that funding is getting directly out to programs. I think that to me is both a success and it's an opportunity for us to keep learning um, and to connect further uh, with our tribal partners to really look to see how can we ensure that that not just the programming is relevant, but the funding stream is culturally relevant and congruent with the needs of our community. So uh, that's an opportunity to grow more.
Yeah, thank you for all that. I've been to several conferences, network conferences, and Thomas is definitely a go-to guy. You see the beard and you're like, there he is. So <laughs> it's nice to have you here to share these insights. And it was great to hear from Tiana at more of a ground level working with the kids. Thomas, here we are at the state level. Shanice, I want to hear on your national perspective, like what what's one thing you're really looking or excited to share about your proudest accomplishment? Yeah. Um, so of course, my background has been very policy driven and focused. Um, I would say it's kind of my niche. So I've been really excited to focus more on learning about the programmatic side and how we can be supportive, um, as well as like a great partner to, you know, the after school alliance, um, the after school network, and learning more about how we can support our native youth. Um, and seeing how these policies and these programs and ideas kind of mesh together. And I think um, the most exciting thing would have to be hearing from our members and uh, within NIA, but also like our partners and our community members, seeing how we can um, collaborate and foster more partnerships. Um, I think that you know, as Native people, we're stronger, and our Native allies, um, we're much stronger when we're in numbers, um, um, and we're all on the same page. So it's been amazing to um, learn more about the after-school time space, um, be able to meet people. We just had our convention. Um, being able to build relationships and kind of grow ideas. I know that, um, I always talk to my friends um, and my colleagues about, you know, learning about their native languages and their like cultural practices and their histories and seeing how similar, you know, as a native Hawaiian, um, you know, the the mo'olelo or the stories are very similar. Uh, and just being able to see what after school time our native communities are Native Keiki children, um, what that looks like within the next five to five to ten years. Um, so I think just being hopeful about the future and being able to engage and you know make known that like after school has always existed, this research has always existed, and just like putting it on paper. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we've heard our highlights. Thomas and Tiana, I'd love to hear what some of the main barriers that you guys are encountering with American Indian and Indigenous youth and families when it comes to accessing after school programs in your community, your state. What are you seeing? And then, Shanice, I'd love for you to follow up in your opinion what sort of resources could NIEA support in breaking down those barriers? Thomas, do you want to start first? Yeah, I would say a, a, by far our biggest barrier is just a lack of uh, programming um, in our state. You know, for every one child that's in a program, we know three are waiting. Uh, that number exponentially rose once we are looking inside of our rural uh, communities, um, especially for us in Alaska. Many of our communities, uh, I would say, are rural and remote that sometimes take multiple forms of transportation to, to get there. And so it's sometimes a lack of the opportunity. I'd say the other piece is that the funding streams oftentimes are not relevant to the type of programming. So it's looking at what we traditionally in in a uh, Western education context think of, of after school of being, okay, it's this many number of days a week, this many hours a week, really looking at how do we uh, look at and change that model and recognizing that, especially in many of our tribal communities, that's going to look different. Uh, when it is fish season or berry picking season, you know, how do we look at that as part of the uh, the out of school time landscape, I think is one of the things that we as a, a collective entity are still working on and doing. And I think that funding mechanisms can oftentimes be the thing that prevents the those uh, uh, programs or those uh, those kind of collaborative ways of knowing. Uh, 
that can prevent it from happening. The other piece, uh, I think uh, everyone on this call can uh, relate to this. I was amazed uh, about the, the mileage <laughs> y'all were putting on transportation, transportation, transportation. Um, and that uh, that is a major barrier for youth participation, both in urban and rural Alaska. Um, we know that, you know, sometimes it is a matter of how do we get kids from point A to point B safely? And then others it is, how do we really figure out how instead to not think about how do we move kids, but how do we move program uh, locations to where kids are? So whether that's upriver on fish camp or whether, uh, so we have some really fantastic uh, 4-H programming happening in Bristol Bay, uh, where fish camp, uh, the 4-H program goes and meets students uh, at their fish camp locations, and really thinking of thinking of that differently. Instead of kids coming to us, how do we go to kids um, and go to community? And I think those are some of the things that we see uh, as some of the barriers and challenges of it. What we do know is that our Alaska Native families and our Pacific Islander families, they want after school. They love their after school programs here in Alaska. Um, and we just have to do a better job of getting more programs uh, around the state. Thank you. Tiana, what are you seeing? Similar, different? A lot of it is similar. So one of our biggest challenges, since we bring students here, as far as providing to our students, we're okay. Um, however, trying to engage our parents is a bit challenging. Um, we can offer some Zoom activities and some occasional activities where they come in, um, but also uh, involving parents equally because we do have some local parents and then we have parents that are uh, in Idaho. <laughs> and so uh, it just depends. Um, so that's one challenge for us. The main thing I see, though, is maybe the um, engagement for um, the rest of the schools on the Navajo Reservation. And so because there is definitely um, I don't know. I honestly don't know um, a lot of the programs that are offered, but I know that there are students that live in extremely rural areas and may not have um, uh, likely don't have. Uh, reliable transportation. And so, and then another challenge is that a, our, a lot of our students um, are caretakers for their families, you know, and so um, they're helping to care, take care of their younger siblings. They might be helping to take care of their grandparents. And so, um, and some of the, similar to kind of what Thomas is bringing up, um, some of the traditional life ways um, are time consuming, you know, they're beautiful, but it takes a lot of time to gather foods, process foods, um, farm, uh, herd sheep. <laughs> and so um, those things. So um, I think that's where we try to provide programming that teaches our students how to do that and to involve that. Um, um, and to create that understanding between our our rural students and our our um, what's the word I'm looking for our inner city students our urban students <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and so um, <clears throat> um, but those are the main challenges I see is mainly for us here at Navajo Prep is um, is parent engagement and and providing that equally to all parents. Yeah, before Shanice jumps in, there was a question in the chat, uh, which everybody be sure you drop things in. These guys are a wealth of knowledge. Um, there was a question about how do you engage currently with parents and communities? Like, what have you found that has worked for you? Maybe it's not perfect, but is there something that is working for you, Tiana? So for me, one of the biggest things, again, it's not necessarily equal just yet, but, um, and it's been, maybe it's one parent at a time as far as um, that request to parents to come and share their expertise. Um, so we've had some some parents come here and run a, run a program after school on a weekly basis, um, mm -hmm. really providing a lot of value, I, I think, to the program. Um, so that's been one way. 
um, and to really build a stronger relationship with those parents. Um, that is the main area that um, our program is really trying to focus on this year. Um, but even just uh, two days ago, we had a Native American Heritage Month uh, round dance that we did um, so that our students can learn um, teachings from other other regions as well. Um, and we had some parents come out for that. And it kind of worked out that we ended up being, so this is something new I'm learning, is it ended up being right next door to um, uh, our basketball or uh, volleyball games. And so we just kind of told everybody, come on over, you can come over here too. So um, uh, maybe using the sporting events to, yeah. to help us out as well. And so um, that's an area that's really worked. Um, and then lately we've just been sharing with parents. Um, you guys are welcome to come and take part whenever you want to. Like you're, um, this is for your students, but you being here with them is, is beneficial to them too. So come on over. And so a lot of the times the parents seem, parents guardians seem to really like like the crafting, crafting activities, the cultural activities too, because um, there's a good amount of them that didn't, didn't grow up with that either. And so, or they're just proud to see that it's being taught here um, for their students as well. So, yeah, absolutely. I do want to correct myself. I get caught up in saying parent and I'm learning to say caregiver because all families look different, right? It might not be the person who has birthed that human being there in attendance. So I apologize for that. Caregivers, um, caregiver engagement, Thomas and Shanice, what have you found? Ideas, resources, everybody's itching for that knowledge. Um, I think what we found, at least in the research that we're conducting, is I don't, I've never been a fan of math, but <laughs> to put it in an equation perspective, right, is like, you can often, I guess, sorry, let me just retract my statement. Growing up, um, you know, I would always go to play sports um, and my family members who took care of me, my grandparents had this idea of after school time as dropping off the child and then I'll see you in a couple hours. And realizing that the success, at least um, within the child mentally and physically, how important family engagement is. And I know, Don Marie, you mentioned that every family looks different, but to really fully get, have the child to experience and embrace the success of, um, you know, internally within themselves, you need to have families involved. I think, you know, a lot of the time our children are in schools for so many hours, um, but, you know, prior to them going to school, uh, they're with their families um, the entire time. So, you know, it's just the ex after school time, I see it as an extension of the home. Um, so, the engagement is extremely important, um, especially when we have conducted, you know, survey and research within our focus groups. Yeah, especially for working parents, if their schedules are in the evenings that student is spending, I think, Tiana, your group goes until about nine o'clock at night. That's your family for the evening. So I love that you incorporated that looking as after school as family too. Um, that's incredible to highlight. Thomas, do you have any insights, tips, tricks? Yeah, I would say know. we have learned a lot from our uh, program providers and from our tribal partners around the state around this. So uh, as as we all know, with many things, food is a driver uh, to get come out. So many of us, especially our rural summer programs, uh, they will provide free food uh, for the entire family to be able to come in uh, using the summer meals program. Uh, it is looking at, you know, making announcements on the village uh you know, public radio station or over the the, you know, through the variety of ways that communities and families hear about things. It's very different than the way typically a school communicates uh, to families. So it's really uh, looking at those kind of alternative ways. I think another key part 
is making the space, you know, when we when we think of oftentimes an after school, uh, using the Weikert Center tools, we're thinking of that pyramid of program quality, we're thinking of that welcoming warm space. Well, the, the more that we're able to look at how does the space and how does the program reflect the cultures of, uh, of our students and their families to create that welcoming space? Especially when we know the historic trauma that happened around boarding schools um, and the uh, dismantling of Native communities due to the education system, we're, we're in the mix of that and we have to be aware of that nuance. And how do we really help shape and change the space to be one that is culturally congruent and of the community. So it's looking at things, you know, some of our programs, they go as far as like everything's labeled in the uh, uh, in the program space with the specific name uh, from the, uh, the local indigenous uh, culture. So it's really looking at and reflecting what the community looks like. It's bringing in elders into the space so that if uh, the uh, connecting, having youth go out from the program and connect with elders, um, so it's an opportunity for that intergenerational connection. I think that is so true in this work that the more we foster that, especially if you if you can get your, uh, the elders in the community connected to your program, you have the community connected to your program at that point. And if you have, you know, that auntie everyone knows in the community, if they are, are the uh, ones coming into the program and sharing language or culture or beating or, uh, you know, uh, sewing or other activities, it's a real opportunity for us to look at after school and out of school time as the kind of hub of the community and that welcoming space that provides that entry point for many of our families into that school and education learning environment that may have uh, been something that they felt were uh, that they were forced out of or were forced out of. So I think after school has that unique space. So I think food, I think Everything we can do to make the space feel welcoming and inclusive, that they uh, that students and families see themselves in the space, from the pictures to the stories to the activities we're leading to the language we're using. I think all those things matter and are really engaging uh, our Native communities inside of out of school time. Yeah, and and to your point, after school might be the only access or time that parents step foot into that building and get to learn about what was going on with that that child's academic day. And I feel like after school has been such a great space to be in the know-how of that because more often than not, a lot of the after school people are in the know-how of what happened during that school day. So just building those bridges alone and getting the caregiver involvement by way of them coming to your after school program to pick up that child is a big deal. That's a bridge. Um, there was a question for Tiana about if you partner with other schools. After you answer that, um, I want to give everybody an opportunity, the three of you, to, to answer this one question of what is your key takeaway or piece of advice you'd like to leave our audience about improving after school programs for Native American Indigenous youth? Um, but before we get into that, Tiana, could you answer? Um, about the program partnerships? So as of right now, we don't partner with other schools per se, um, but we are partnering um, at the beginning stages of our partnership with the local Boys and Girls Club that serves the schools in our area. And so they were actually reaching out to um, get support with more cultural activities. And so um, we've had them over here a couple of times and we're working on getting that to be a more on a more regular basis. And so, yeah, that's awesome. That's probably building up so much confidence in the youth that are teaching those lessons like that alone is such a valuable life skill. Um, so to ask the question again, final thoughts, um, one key takeaway, if people could just listen to one final thing and take one thing out of this whole session. I'd love to hear um, what each of you think about for improving our after school programs for Native Americans and Indigenous youth. So let's start with Shanice and then Thomas, and then we'll round out with Tiana. Um, I think one piece of advice would be that at least on the federal side um there are so many grant 
opportunities um, and just funding opportunities in all of the different agencies um, that touch on after school time without it, without explicitly saying it. Um, like the Department of Justice, Department of Ag, um, as well as, you know, some of Department of Education, um, as well as um, Health and Human Services, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. And also looking at philanthropic uh, organizations. There are just so many um, philanthropic organizations that want to hear from our communities and also provide that funding. Um so happy to um, give out my email to kind of follow up on more specifics, but just keeping that in mind in the back of the head that there are funding that doesn't explicitly say after school, but it's out there. Um, just have to use a few keywords and whatnot. Yeah, thank you. And um, I think they'll be able to share your info in the chat. Thank you for that offering. Thomas, one minute. How can we improve? How can we be better? I think it is just being good listeners and being in community with folks. I think one of the biggest things we as a network do is go out and when someone invites us, uh, we go out, we spend time in community, we look for those opportunities to to really help elevate and listen, um, you know, to, to the amazing work that's happening out uh, in our uh, tribal programs throughout our state and with our tribe. So I think really being a good listener and being a um, compassionate and being there and actually physically showing up uh, to communities. Sometimes it takes, you know, a couple planes to get there, but we're thrilled uh, to spend the time uh, and, and be there in partnership. Absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Tiana, how can we improve? Um, I think mine's kind of similar to Thomas's, just um, slight, slight difference. Um, one of the biggest things Sorry, I have so many thoughts going through my head because there's plenty, but um, it's just making sure that the students know that you care. Because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure every single person, just like teachers, um, every person that works in after school is there because they want to be there and they love it and they enjoy um, uh, making a difference in the lives of our youth. And so, um, just making not don't don't be afraid to be honest and genuine with our students and just like Thomas was saying be present let them know you're there and you're ready to be there for the long haul because I know as as a student um growing up at a reservation school we all know that cycle of like teachers come in and they're gone the next year mm -hmm. and so um either that or they don't really think that we can do much they're there for that extra pay. And so um, just making sure students know that you're there because you care. And so, and that you're there to listen to them um, and that this is their program. I constantly try to remind my, remind my students, this program is your program. This is not my program. This is, this is all yours. And I'm gonna do everything to make it the program you want it to be. And so don't hesitate to come and tell me what, what you would like to see this program be, um, what we can add to it. And so we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. I tell them you're my boss, right? And so as much as, you know, aside from the, uh, the things that I absolutely have to listen to <laughs> from the higher ups, right? But um, it's yours. So help me make it what you want it to be. Absolutely. Next generation is everything and they are the voice of change. They really are. So I want to thank you three. I love that we had such a broad spectrum of expertise in the room today. Uh, I feel like we got a really good comprehensive look at what after school means to all of us, um, what we're all going through similarly, and then what we can do to move forward. I know information was shared. Please be sure you ask your questions to the person that you're seeking uh, more information on. Thank you again to After School Alliance and IEA, um, Department of Ed for having me. Oh, how lucky am I to be your moderator today? And I will leave it with Sophie to send us.
Amazing, Don Marie and all of our incredible panelists. Thank you so, so, so much. This has been, this flew by. I feel like I need a whole other hour and 15 minutes just to talk with you all and learn more. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we have an evaluation from the Department of Education um, that's gonna get dropped in the chat. If you have the chance to fill it out, we would love that. Also gonna do some promo for the After School Alliance's program provider survey that just got launched. If you're a provider, please scan this code or go to three to six dot co slash survey. Um, and you can take that. We wanna make sure that programs serving native students are really well represented in our data. Um, and also welcome everyone to share a takeaway or a piece of advice you'd leave you'd like to leave for the audience in the chat and just thank you all again for your time we really really appreciate it